Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Kishore Mabubani. I'm the Dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this uh, Dr. S. T. Lee lecture. Uh, and of course, uh, first of all, I want to begin by talk thanking Dr. Lee Seng Ti uh, for the generous donation that has enabled us to have these very distinguished speakers uh, coming to our school. And today, as you all know, we have a lot of dead Turner. Now, in my introduction, as usual, I'll make uh, three points. Uh, the first point will be what I hope is about the state of the economics, which may be a foolish thing for me to try to do. <laughs> uh, secondly, a bit about the financial sector. And thirdly, I'll introduce uh, our speaker. And I should add that uh, I landed at 5 a.m. this morning, coming straight home from Davos. So if I sound a bit jet-lagged or unclear, I hope you'll excuse me. <laughs> but I also want to share with you my uh, impressions of Davos, having just come back. And this is why I was going to start about discussing the state of economics, because there is a sense of general bewilderment. Uh, I suspect it's global to but what exactly is happening to the economics profession? Why is it all these brilliant economists that we used to rely on to tell us about what's going to happen in the world suddenly get everything wrong, right? As you know, they didn't predict the great 2008-2009 uh, crisis, which is why the, the Queen of England asked this very simple question, why couldn't you see it coming, you know? So, and right now, if you look at the current state of the world, what I found in Davos was massive confusion uh, about what's going to happen. I mean, to give one simple example, uh, the second largest economy in the world is China today. And there were people in uh, uh, Davos with very pessimistic assessments of China. Uh, you know, for example, George Soros, whom you cannot deemed to be a lightweight, I think is a heavyweight figure by any definition, has very confidently predicted that there will be a hard landing for China this year. And if any of you want to take bets, I'll take bets with any of you that there will be no hard landing for China this year. <laughs> you know? So, uh, just one example, in fact, uh, I, I was at a dinner where the uh, a new editor of The Economist was there, Lady Sani, and I told her, I said, your cover story on China, which showed Xi Jinping riding a dragon down, which is about to crash and burn, got it dead wrong. Xi Jinping is riding the dragon up, not down. I mean, that's an one, one more example. So I, I, I mention all this because I think we really need to engage in much deeper reflection on what exactly is happening in the economics profession. And that actually is a very good reason why we've had, we are having a lot of Dad Turner here today, because if at all anyone can throw light on a rather uh, misty, uncertain world out there, it's a uh, lot of Dad Turner. My second point about the financial sector, uh, and this, I must say, uh, I was telling Adair that I actually was asked to uh, actually in a private session conduct a discussion among CEOs of some of the largest banks in the world on how you rebuild trust in the financial sector. And we all know that as a result of the last financial crisis, uh, trust in banking institutions has gone down. And I thought this is just a matter of fact. And indeed, fortunately for me, uh, Richard Edelman uh, issued something called the Edelman Trust Barometer. Uh, and it was one of these sort of curious coincidences in Davos. I ended up, happened to end up working, walking down the road in, in a snowy road in Davos with him and he gave me a good briefing on the uh, Edelman Trust Barometer. And one of the findings is that trust in the financial sector is lower than it is in other sectors, which I thought was a fact. But when I discussed this with some of the CEOs of the banks, uh, I was actually surprised that many of them rejected this. And sometimes I got the perception that they thought the public was wrong and they were right. And I, I mention all this because it is, it is quite stunning that we live in, in some ways in a small world, and yet in this very small world, we can have very, very different perceptions of what's happening uh, in the state of the world. So with all this, let me introduce uh, uh, our speaker, who's had a very uh, uh, distinguished career. 
beginning with a uh, double first in history and economics uh, in Cambridge, where he also became president uh, of the Cambridge Union. He was also chairman of the university's conservative uh, association. I guess he chose his political leanings early. <laughs> Then he's worked with many uh, major institutions. He started with BP, worked for Chase Manhattan Bank, became a director of McKinsey, then director general of the Confederation of British Industry before becoming uh, vice chairman of Merrill Lynch Europe. And then, of course, as we all know, he became chairman of the British Financial Services uh, Authority. Uh, his timing was brilliant. He started two weeks before the Oh, after the Lehman, after Lehman Brothers crash, so you can imagine, you know, you know, literally, people have been thrown through the deep end of a pool. He was thrown through the deep end of a storm, and that's why his perspective uh, uh, is truly uh, very significant because you know he's both a very strong academic and a very strong practitioner. And sometimes in economics, it's always a struggle to bring together the academics and the practitioners. And one man who can do this is Lord Dad Turner. And the good news, of course, is that he's written a book about it. Uh, I'm going to advertise the book before and after the event. So I'm going to tell you the book is on sale outside. I strongly recommend to you. Uh, there are a limited number of copies. If I were you, I'll rush and buy one <laughs> immediately after uh, uh, the lecture. I want to mention he's also published uh, other books, Just Capital, The Liberal Economy, and also Economics After the Crisis, published in 2012. So I'm sure you'll agree that we're going to get a, a treat now listening to Adair. So with that, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the stage. Kishore, thank you very much for that introduction. It's a, a delight to be back here at the Lee Kuan Yew School, where I've uh, spoken before, indeed spent a, a whole week here uh, a couple of uh, years ago. Um, Kishore was quite right in saying that uh, I became chairman of the UK Financial Services Authority at a very particular time. Indeed, I will never forget precisely what day I became chairman. It was uh, Saturday, September the 20th, uh, 2008, which was precisely five days after Lehman's uh, had collapsed and was the onset of a complete seizure of the global financial system. As I've said on a number of occasions, it was rather like being made captain of the Titanic after you've hit the iceberg, but before you've actually sunk. Um, actually, there's a particular reason why I remember so precisely that it is Saturday, the uh, 20th of September, that I started at the FSA, because actually I had originally agreed with the government that I was going to start on Monday the 22nd. I mean, you normally start new jobs on, say, a Monday, but the previous Monday... Uh, my predecessor, Callum McCarthy, rang me on the morning of uh, Monday the 15th of September 2008, and he said, Adair, what is it, when does your contract say you're starting? And I said, well, I'm starting next Monday, Monday the 22nd. He said, well, uh, can we get that changed? Because I've had a terrible weekend, and if things go wrong next weekend, I want it to be your weekend, not, <laughs> not my weekend. So... The UK Treasury changed my contract in the course of that week and it said very precisely that I would start work at one minute past midnight on the morning of Saturday the 20th of September. And I think very few people have probably signed such a specific uh, labour contract that defined it to the precise minute. Now, Autumn 2008 for me, as for anybody in the area of financial regulation in the advanced economies or central bankers, was taken up with crisis management. We were trying to stop the extreme crisis that had emerged in September turning into a real collapse of the global financial system. And that required emergency liquidity measures, recapitalizations of banks, uh, all sorts of measures of uh, that nature. And there really wasn't time in those first few months to think much about why it had occurred or what we were going to do for the future. But by the time we got through to, say, January 2009, our attention switched to 
Why had this occurred? And how did we need to re-regulate the global financial system to make it more stable? And I had a major role in that. I was chair of the major policy committee of the International Financial Stability Board, and I played a major role, therefore, in the design of all that techie stuff which goes by the name Basel III, capital standards, liquidity standards, bank resolution procedures to prevent too big to fail, Counter, central counterparty clearing of derivatives, trades, etc. Lots of incredibly techy stuff that we had to negotiate and agree between all the regulators and central bankers of the world in endless meetings in uh, windowless rooms in Basel, uh, which is where all this stuff uh, goes on. And I actually think we did a pretty good job on that. So I'm proud of the job that I and the others did uh, in that period of time. I think we now have a global banking system which has more capital and more liquidity, lots more capital and liquidity than it had in uh, 2007 when the crisis originally broke. And I think that means that we are much less likely to face a suddenly developing financial crisis of the sort that occurred in September 2008, where as it were, one domino falls over and then another and another and another. I think the financial system itself, narrowly defined, is, and I hope I'm not being too optimistic, less risky than it when was. But I also became convinced over the subsequent four years to 2013, as I chaired this policy committee and was involved in this debate, that while we were doing good things for the financial system itself, we were really only skimming the surface of the fundamental reasons why the crisis of 2008 occurred, and in particular, the fundamental reasons why recovery from the crisis has been, in many countries, so slow and difficult. And I think it's important to remember that in January 2009, if you had said to somebody in the IMF, in the Federal Reserve, in the Bank of England, in any of the treasuries of the advanced economies in the ECB, that six years later, seven years later, we would still have interest rates close to zero, that we would be struggling with inadequate inflation, that we'd be talking about disappointing growth, and that the IMF would have just produced a week ago yet another downgrade of its forecasts for the global economy, and that in major economies of UK and European Union, uh, the Eurozone, GDP per capita, income per capita, is either below where it was in 2007 or only above by a very small sliver. If you'd said that to anybody in January 2009, you would have been considered idiotically pessimistic because it was assumed that, yes, this had been a crisis, but economies always have strong recoveries from crisis. This has been a very major setback to our assumption that capitalism, even in the richest countries of the world, is bound, if not year after year, at least decade after decade, to always produce significant improvements in living standards. So given the scale of the setback, we really have to think why that occurred. And my book is as much about why the recovery has been so difficult as why the crisis occurred. And if I had to sum up one fundamental fact which is central to my analysis, when it, which I think explains those two phenomena, uh, it is this chart. This chart shows the growth of debt, and this is private debt, this is not government debt, this is private debt, corporate or household, in the advanced economies over the 60 years running up to the crisis. And as you can see, in the advanced economies in aggregate, in 1950, private debt to GDP was 50% of GDP, and by 2007, it had reached 170% of GDP, and it grew pretty much every year, that leverage ratio, from 1950 to 2007, and as you can see, it increased at an accelerating rate after about 1990. Now, what is intriguing is that as that leverage growth occurred, it rang very few alarm bells. Because if you went to 
most universities with finance theorists and macroeconomists before the crisis and talked about this growth of leverage, you would have either had an attitude which treated it as positively benign or as simply irrelevant. The positively benign attitude tended to dominate down at what I call the finance end of the corridor, where there were finance theorists who could explain why in an economy we need debt contracts as well as equity contracts, why market economies can't be all equity, why the 19th century British Industrial Revolution required the creation of debt bonds as well as equity contracts and banks which created uh, new money and lent it out. And there were analyses which were econometric analyses which argued that financial deepening in general, a larger financial system as a percent of GDP but in particular more private credit as a percent of GDP was good for growth. There's an overall meta-analysis of the literature by a man called Ross Levine in 2005 that said, look, if you put all the pictures together, it is clear that more private credit as a percent of GDP is good for growth. And there were various analyses that said, look at India. It only has private credit to GDP of 10%. If only it had private credit of GDP of 50%, our econometrics suggest that it would grow X percent faster. And there was really very little thought given to the proper position that it might be possible as well as too little private credit to GDP, it might be possible to have too much. Meanwhile, if you went down the other end of the academic corridor to the modern monetary theorists, broadly speaking, uh, they were completely uninterested uh, in this because they had developed some theories about the way monetary economics worked where you really didn't have to pay much attention to what happened in the banking and the financial system. And if you don't believe me in this, believe these two people. Olivier Blanchard said in 2012, Olivier was uh, chief economist of the IMF until a few months ago, we assumed we could ignore much of the details of the financial system. Or as Mervyn King, former uh, governor of the Bank of England, put it, the dominant new Keynesian model of monetary economics lacks an account of financial intermediation so that money, credit and banks play no meaningful role. Now, you, you might think that somewhat surprising. How would you have a model of the monetary economy and have how interest rates affect the real economy and not have banks in it? But that really was the case. There were things called dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models, which central banks were very proud of, which had contracts going on between representative agent companies and representative agent a, a, a households, but you really didn't have a banking system in these models at all. And as Kishore said earlier, this raises very major questions about uh, what economics was up to. It really is quite difficult to see a financial crisis coming if your workhouse model for thinking about the economy doesn't even have a financial system in it. So we were just not looking at the major problems that were coming towards us. But what's interesting is that that attitude of either this growth of leverage was benign or it was just neutral, we didn't need to pay attention to it, that might have been true if two things that we say about banks in our economic textbooks are true. If you pick up an undergraduate economic textbook and look at the section where it describes what banks do, it will tend to say something of the following nature. It will say on one page, banks take deposits of money from savers and they lend it on to borrowers and it tends to assume that those borrowers are businesses. That's the predominant assumption made. And it will say that banks lend money to entrepreneurs and businesses and that by doing so they allocate scarce savings resources between alternative capital investment projects. And you will find lots of discussion in economic textbooks and in advanced macro papers about whether banks do that capital allocation process between alternative capital uh, projects well or not. The problem is that as an account of what banks do in developed advanced economies, these two statements are pretty much entirely fictional. 
They're fictional for two reasons. First, banks do not just take pre-existing money and lend it on. They create credit, money, and purchasing power that did not previously exist. And that central insight into what banks do was absolutely core to the writing of early 20th century economists such as the Swedish economist Knut Wicksell, the Austrian economist uh, Friedrich von Hayek, uh, the Chicago economist Henry Simons or uh, Irving Fisher. All these people understood that the fundamental thing about banks was that they could create credit and money and purchasing power. And yet to an extraordinary extent that insight disappears from modern macroeconomics from about the 1970s onwards. And that is fundamental. Because if they create credit, money, and purchasing power, it's absolutely essential to understand to whom do they allocate that credit, money, and purchasing power. And there you get the second fiction, that banks lend money to entrepreneurs to finance capital investment. My calculation for the UK banking system is that that is about 15% of what bank lending does. Because bank lending might do that, but it could also do two completely different things. One is lend money to consumers to finance increased consumption. And the other is lend money to people or companies so that they can finance a competition between each other for the ownership of assets that already exist. Those assets might be stocks and shares, they might be paintings, they might be fine wine, but above all what they are in pure quantity is existing real estate assets. And the vast majority of what modern banking systems do in America or indeed the debt capital markets in America do or in Europe or in Japan is lend money against real estate. Now some people when I say that say oh yeah but Adair we all know that British people are completely bonkers about houses. They spend all their life trying to buy houses so that'll be true in Britain but it isn't true elsewhere. But there's a very fine piece of empirical analysis uh, which has been done uh, by uh, three economists uh, uh, Alan Taylor, uh, Oscar Yorda and Maurice Schillerick in an article called the, the a paper called The Great Mortgaging and what they've done is they've looked at what the advanced economy banking systems have done all the way back to 1870. And as you can see on this chart, first of all, I would, I would sort of ignore the huge fluctuations in the early 20th centuries. Uh, when you have wars and hyperinflations and funding of governments to fight wars and hyperinflations riding off debt, you get extraordinary volatility in seri this series. But basically, think about this chart as being from the 1870s through to about the 1950s, banks lend about 35% of their money in residential real estate mortgages, but then that proportion just goes up and up and up in the late 20th century. And in addition to this, which is residential mortgages, you've got to add commercial real estate lending on top. And the way that Taylor, Schillerick and Yorda sum up their statement is they say, up until the 1970s, banks in advanced economies did predominantly do what our textbook say that they do, but since then they have become predominantly real estate lenders and the words they use are the textbook definition of what banks do, lending money to non-real estate companies to find project in, uh, capital investment now accounts for a very small percentage of the business of banking. Now this is fundamental, we have to understand this, we have to understand what banks are actually doing to have an economic understanding of their implications. Oh sorry, I, I meant to actually put up their words uh, from Oscar Yorda, Morris Schuller and Alan Taylor. With very few exceptions, the bank's primary business consisted of non-mortgage lending to companies as late as 1970. But by 2007, banks in most countries had turned primarily into real estate lenders. The intermediation of household savings for productive investment in the business sector, which as they say is the standard economics textbook definition of what banks do, constitutes only a minor share of the business of banking today. Well, that has one implication, which is that probably we should change our economic textbooks so that they actually reflect reality. But it also means that we have to understand the implications of this for financial instability. And the implications follow from the following fact. 
Real estate, property, existing real estate, is locationally specific. And its specific location is crucially important to its value. The hotel on the beach is worth far more than the hotel a mile away. The piece of property in the nice part of town or the center of town, the, her house is worth a huge multiple of exactly the same square meterage of house in another bit of town. And the vast majority of the value of locationally specific urban real estate does not rely, reside in the constructed value of the building, it relies upon the scarce supply of uh, urban land on which the real estate sits. And I think that's probably as true in Singapore uh, as anywhere else uh, in the world. But this has a very particular consequence because those locationally specific real estate is in scarce supply. You can't easily create more of it. Now, you guys in Singapore have taken that to a greater extent than most people because every now and then you fill in another bit of the harbour. But on the whole, locationally specific real estate is in somewhat inelastic supply. And that means that when we extend more credit to finance a competition for that ownership of it, the only thing that can really give is the price. But when the price goes up, that changes both the net worth of the borrowers and the net worth of the lenders and their expectations of future price increases, which enables both borrowers and lenders to borrow and lend more money, and which convinces them that borrowing and lending more money uh, is a good thing, which then takes us round in a cycle. And these cycles of increasing credit against real estate, producing more real estate price increases, producing more uh, credit against real estate, are not just part of the story of financial instability in modern economies. They are again and again almost the whole story. Because what happens is eventually that this cycle, and this is the cycle which Hyman Minsky described uh, in his famous but largely ignored uh, books on economic instability, this cycle eventually produces a crisis when people feel the prices are just so high that I don't believe them, and then it swings into reverse where falling prices uh, produce loss of confidence, loss of net worth, and falling credit, and it goes down the other way. And this is the story of why there was a Japanese boom and bust in the 1980s and 90s. It's the story of the Scandinavian uh, banking crisis of the early 1990s, of Massachusetts in the late 1980s, and of Spain and Ireland and the US and the UK in 2007. And the trouble is that once the crisis occurs, and if it occurs at a level, at a point where the level of debt in the economy is already very high, we enter a situation where debt never goes away, it just shifts around the economy, and where it appears that all our classic policy levers to get the economy going again are blocked. Now, we ought to have known that this was a danger with this rise of credit because we had a canary in the mine, and the canary was called Japan. In the 1980s, Japan had one of the most extreme of these credit and real estate booms that the world has ever seen. Uh, there were increases of commercial real estate value. It was primarily in commercial real estate rather than residential real estate. And it was primarily companies that were borrowing it rather than individuals, but the cycle was still the same. There were increases in commercial real estate values of four times in five years, increases in the amount of credit extended of two and a half or three times in five years. There were those famous most probably uh, mythical stories that if only you could redevelop the land of the imperial palace it would be worth more than the whole of state of California. Probably a bit of an overstatement but directionally correct in, in terms of the madness which was gritting Japan. That cycle came to an end in 1990. And then it went into reverse and real estate prices fell by 70%. And what then happened, as beautifully described by Richard Koo in his book, The Balance Sheet Recession, a uh, holy grail of macroeconomics, lessons from Japan's Great Recession, what happened then was that a whole load of corporates became determined 
to pay down their debt because they felt over leveraged against these collapsed real estate values. And they did that. They tried to pay down their debt and they kept on trying to pay down their debt even when the Bank of Japan cut the interest rate to zero because they were inelastic to the interest rate. They were trying to restore their balance sheets. And the only thing that kept the Japanese economy going at that stage was that when the companies cut their investment and drove the economy into a recession, that led to a fall in tax revenues and a rise in public expenditures on things like unemployment benefit, and the government ran large deficits, which offset to a degree the deleveraging of the private sector. And if they hadn't run those deficits, there would have been an even deeper recession in Japan. But with the inevitable consequence that while the corporate sector very slowly deleveraged, the red line, corporate sector debt as a percent of GDP, the public sector leveraged up and up and up, going from about 50% of GDP to 250% of GDP and still rising. Once you have a large amount of debt and you get to what we call the Minsky moment where the upswing of the cycle comes to an end, once you've got that large amount of debt, it doesn't go away. It simply shifts around the economy. It shifts from the private to the public sector, but total leverage, public and private combined, simply goes up. And that pattern which you see there in Japan, has been repeated since the crisis in Spain, in Ireland, in the UK, in the US, and for the developed economies in total. Here you can see in the red line for the developed economies in total, some deleveraging of the household sector, no actual deleveraging of the corporate sector, just a reduction in the, a, a, a capping out, but no deleveraging, but a very significant increase in the leverage of the public sector. So that if we put the three together, the top line here, developed market debt to GDP, private and public combined, has continued to go up. Now, it's continued to go up at a slightly lower rate of growth, but that's also because there's been a shift of debt to another part of the world, and that's the emerging economy debt, and in particular China. And that increase of the emerging economy debt, and in particular China, isn't just circumstantial. It isn't just there was a crisis in the US and China happened simultaneously to decide to leverage up. The one followed directly from the other. In early 2009, the Chinese authorities were frightened that deleveraging by overleveraged, overindebted US companies and households would lead, as it did, to significant forms, falls in Chinese export demand, and that that would then have effects on Chinese employment. So what they did was offset that by unleashing the biggest credit and investment boom the world has ever seen with debt to GDP in China going from about 140% to something like 240% and still rising fast over the last six years. And with the investment percent of GDP at an already very high 41% increasing to 48% as huge quantities of concrete uh, were poured into apartment blocks and six lane highways and convention centers and metros, etc. Much of which will indeed be valuable for China but some of which, particularly in the third and fourth tier cities, I think will end up as significantly wasted real resources. And whereas I said that I think the story about the imperial palace in Japan is an urban myth, I believe the following fact is actually a fact, that China poured more concrete in the four years after 2009 than the US did in the whole of the 20th century. I think it's impossible to understand just what an enormous investment boom this has been. But it is an investment boom which is bound to come to an end, and I think has come to an end now. And if I could pick up Kishore's point about how worried should we be of China, and does my George friend, good friend George Soros uh, overstate it in saying a Chinese hard landing this year? My point of view is the hard landing 
in the industrial sector has already occurred. I think at the overall economy level, it will continue to grow at a reasonable pace because the service sector is growing. But in the industrial sector, and in particular the heavy industrial sector, construction, the production of steel, cement, uh, glass, etc. I think it's possible that China actually had an actual contraction of industrial production last year, and it is that which is relevant to the rest of the world, because it is that, at very least, significant slowdown, perhaps contraction, which is driving a major deflationary effect uh, into the East Asian uh, uh, supply chains in large capital goods, etc. You see that in today's Japanese export figures, but also crucially into the commodity markets of the world. And so what we had is a huge build-up of debt in the developed economies before 2008, an attempted deleveraging by the private sector after that, which induced a Chinese response of driving up leverage, which is now running out of steam, which is in itself then driving an, in, an extra deflationary twist to the real economy. And the trouble is, we then enter an environment in which it appears that all our classic policy levers to keep the economies going and to have a reasonable level of nominal demand and inflation which is as high as we want it, maybe 2%, they appear blocked. We think about funded fiscal deficits, running fiscal deficits funded with bond finance. And initially, that's what we do, and that undoubtedly has a first round stimulative effect. And indeed, back in April 2009, at the meeting of the G20 in uh, London, it was agreed by all the major economies of the world that they would all simultaneously increase their fiscal deficits to stimulate the economies. And its immediate effect was undoubtedly positive, as it was with those Japanese deficits back in the 1990s. But after a while, you start worrying about long-term debt sustainability, because your public debt's going up. So you start introducing fiscal consolidation austerity programs, trying to pull down public debt as well. But then you're in an environment that if the private sector is still deleveraging and the public sector tries to deleverage as well, you will, really will drive the economy into a deep recession, unless the central bankers come along and say, oh no, we can deal with this problem. You consolidate the fiscal stance, tighten the fiscal stance, we'll have ultra-loose monetary policy. We'll have interest rates close to zero, or now even negative, and we'll have quantitative easing to bring down uh, the long end of the yield curve, and that will keep the economies going. But the only trouble with that is that the real transmission mechanism of that through to the real economy is unclear. Once you've already got very low interest rates, it's not clear that marginally lower interest rates make all that much difference. In Germany now, the 10-year yield on a government 10-year bond is 54 basis points, 0.54%. If Mario Draghi in March at the ECB Governing Council meeting declares a new wave of QE as a result of which he gets that 10-year bond yield down from 0.54 to 0.4 or 0.3, there is almost no likelihood that that is suddenly going to unleash a whole extra amount of investment by business. Once interest rates are already low, the response is just not that elastic. So people say, oh no, that's not how it works. It, it works through driving up asset prices, lower bond yields, higher equity prices, and then people will feel richer, they'll start spending more money, companies will see a higher share price, and they'll start investing more. And there probably are such transmission mechanisms up to a point, but they're pretty weak and pretty indirect, and they have the irony that they produce an increase in inequality, and as I'll come back to later, rising inequality may be one of the reasons why we've got too much credit in the first place. So you then say, oh well, no, that's not how it works. It works through a lower currency. It works through devaluation. And if you <coughs> listen carefully to the words of <coughs> Mario Draghi or uh, Kuruda-san in Japan, they're pretty close sometimes to admitting that their transmission mechanism for QE is through the exchange rate. But there you've got an irony that that can't work for everybody. Right? We can't devalue 
all our currencies against the moon or against Mars. That has to be a zero-sum game. And indeed, the central irony is that all these policies can only really work by re-stimulating the very growth of credit which got us into this mess in the first place. So we seem to end up, after this growth of credit, stuck with some really unattractive, unavoidable choices, or completely stuck. People talk about us being out of ammunition. The phrase is used that if there's another turn down in the economy this year, the central bankers can't do more, they're out of ammunition. And indeed, I think the central problem that we have to realize is that there is so much debt, private or public, in the world today, that we essentially face this apparent unavoidable choice. Either we are going to be stuck with sustained low growth and low inflation below what we ought to be achieved, or we're going to try and erode the debt via ultra-low interest rates maintained you know, year after year, which will help deal with the existing debt, but with the ironic effect that it creates huge incentives for yet more debt to be created for the future. Or we have large debt write-offs, default and restructuring, but that has a disruptive and a depressive effect. This is the quandary in which you are placed if you first allow too much debt to accumulate in your economy. Given that analysis, there are two questions for public policy. One is, okay, how should we run economies in future so that we don't create too much debt? Or to put it another way, what should we have been doing back in the 1980s and 90s so that we didn't get into this mess in the first place? And the second question is, yes, but given that we are where we are, what on earth are we going to do to deal with this huge debt overhang? Let me comment on each of those points. The first, what do we do to avoid too much debt, takes us back to what I describe as a fundamental dilemma of modern economic growth, which is that it seems to be dependent on a credit growth which is bound to produce instability. In the advanced economies, in the two decades before the crisis. You can sum up the macroeconomic picture as on the top of this slide. We tended to have nominal GDP growth, the nominal value of national income, growing at about 4 or 5 percent per annum. And the central bankers were very proud of that because they said this is a great moderation and this is exactly what we want. Because when nominal GDP grows at 4 or 5 percent per annum, you can combine inflation at about 2 percent, and there's a theory of why that's probably better than either 10 percent or 0 percent, with say the 2 percent growth rates which are typical of countries which are already at the frontier of a uh, high productivity. So 5 percent, 4 or 5 percent nominal GDP GDP growth, this looked like a great achievement, and that's exactly what we wanted. But the trouble is that throughout that two decades, nominal credit on average in the advanced economies was growing at 10 to 15 percent per annum. And it seemed at the time that we sort of needed this nominal credit growth in order to have nominal GDP growth of 4 or 5 percent. Because after all, if we disliked the nominal credit growth and said that's too high, and central banks had raised interest rates <coughs> to slow the nominal credit growth down, all our models said we'd have had a lower growth in nominal GDP. So we seem to have a system where we need, this is a bit of mathematical notation, C dot means the growth rate of C, we need the growth rate of nominal credit to be faster than the growth rate of nominal GDP in order to have adequate nominal GDP growth. But if that is the case, then we do not, in technical terms, have an equilibrium in a monetary economy. We instead have a system which is eventually bound to blow up. So a central question which I ask in my book is, are we just bound to instability? Is there something about an economy which can only grow with a growth of credit faster than GDP, which is therefore bound to produce rising leverage and bound to produce crisis? The answer I give is no. I think it is possible for us to have 
modern economies which grow in an equilibrium where on average over time nominal credit grows in line with nominal GDP. But in order to achieve that, we need to address some fundamentals of why our economic growth path is so credit intensive. And we need completely different approaches to financial regulation. In terms of the fundamentals, and these are the things that the central bankers and the financial regulators cannot themselves fix because they are deeper still than their tools, I think there are three fundamental drivers of why growth in our economies is so credit intensive. One of those is rising inequality. The other is the central role of real estate in advanced rich economies. And the third is global current account imbalances. Over the last 30 or 40 years, in most advanced economies and an increasing number of emerging economies, we have seen very significant increases in inequality. Over the last 35 years in the US, wage earners in the bottom quarter of the income distribution have received no real wages whatsoever, while the incomes of the top 1% have gone up three times and the incomes of the top 0.1% have gone up even more. <clears throat> now, it is an observable fact that richer people have a higher marginal propensity to save. If you give a rich person a bonus of a million pounds, they will save a greater proportion of that than if you give a poor person a bonus of 100 pounds. And the implication of that is that if you have that fact plus rising inequality, if nothing else changed, we might have an imbalance between the change in desired savings not matched by a change in a desired investment. There would, in technical terms, be an increase in the ex-ante attempted or desired savings rate. And if that was not offset, and there's no reason why it should be offset by an increase in the investment requirements in the economy, that would give a deflationary impetus to growth, which would tend to produce a low rate of nominal GDP growth, and it would also tend to produce low equilibrium real interest rates. And you would have a problem of a sort of secular stagnation, and this is one of the, the explanations behind secular stagnation, unless, essentially, the financial system picked up the savings of the rich and lent it to the middle income and the poor, facilitated by the low interest rates, which were the equilibrium result of the change in the balance of desired savings and desired investment. And I think that is an important part of what happened in some economies, and in particular, I think, in the US economy uh, before the crisis. And I, the book, which I think is a brilliant description of that in one particular chapter, is the book by Raghu Rajan, uh, now the uh, Reserve Bank Governor in India, who, who in his book, Fault Lines, has a chapter uh, with the wonderful chapter title, Let Them Eat Credit. Because his argument is that faced with rising inequality in the US, the US political system could not work out either how to deal with it in terms of skills or the nature of jobs which would offset it before distribution, nor was willing to uh, support the taxes and expenditures which would redistribute income. Its only answer was basically to make easy credit available to subprime borrowers so that even though their real wages were stagnant, they felt good as long as house prices were going up but not when house prices went going up. So it was an apparent solution to the problem but no solution at all. So I think that we may be unable to solve this problem of an increasingly credit intensive economy unless we also deal with the fundamental problems of rising inequality. The second fundamental feature, and this feature is not going to go away because it's inherent to modern economies, and we just need to recognize that it exists and then work out how best to ameliorate it, is the rising importance of real estate within wealth in modern economies. Now, some of you have probably bought Thomas Piketty's book, Capital in the 21st Century. A smaller subset of you, 
have actually read Thomas Piketty's book from beginning to the end of its 600 pages. Um, but it does have some fantastic insights in it. And the following chart is taken from Piketty's book. This shows the central fact which Piketty talks about, which is this extraordinary change in the relationship between capital, wealth in an economy, and income. And he points out that back in the 18th and 19th century, in Britain, in France, but also in Germany and in the US, capital output ratios or wealth to output ratios, capital to income ratios, tended to be about five or six. That that went down in the mid 20th century to sort of two or three, but that over the last half century it's gone up again to five or six. And Thomas Piketty has a whole series of complex theories uh, related to the relationship between S, the rate of saving, and G, the rate of growth, to try and understand what's going on there. But what is intriguing is that Piketty does not himself stress the fact which is absolutely clear from his own figures, and this chart is taken directly from Piketty's book. Because the most striking thing on this chart is, uh, if you look at the green bit uh, there, I'll just have to see how I point... Oh, no, I'll just come and point here. The green bit there, as you can see, explains not only a large proportion, but almost all of the increase in the wealth to income ratio. Uh, the red bit goes up a bit, but not all that much. It is the green bit that dominates. And the green bit is urban real estate. It's urban housing. And indeed, work by Maurice Schullerich also finds out that of that increase in the value of urban housing, in Britain, in France, in all the advanced economies, 70% or even 80% is explained by the value, the increase in the value of the land on which the housing sits, uh, not uh, by the, uh, a, 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 the constructed value uh, of the house. Now, that is a central fact. I think that fact derives from some things which are inherent in modern economies. I think it is almost inherent that as people get richer, they will choose to spend an increasing proportion of their income competing with one another to own desirably located real estate. So it's not going to go away, but it has some very major implications because the easiest thing for the banking system to lend against is real estate values. I can tell you as somebody who's been a practical banker, lending money against a non-real estate business proposition is damn hard because you've got to look at the business plan, you've got to look at the entrepreneur. It just feels easy to lend money against real estate because you just have to look at the valuation. Because So given that we've got this effect, we will have a financial system which left to itself will always migrate to real estate lending. And then the third fundamental factor is current account imbalances. It is a simple piece of mathematics that if Germany, as it is today, is running an 8 point 0.5% current account surplus as a percent of GDP. And if that current account surplus is not fully offset by German purchases of real property and equity somewhere else in the world, then it will have to be matched by debt contracts somewhere else in the world. And these issues of major imbalances between large current account surplus countries and large current account deficit countries are fundamental to why we get too much credit. So we have to deal with those fundamental drivers of credit intensity. And there's a set of issues that I explore in my book about how we do that and whether we're going to be able to do it. But I think we also need a completely different approach to the way that we've run the combination of monetary policy and a, uh, a prudential policy. And in particular, we need a focus on what we increasingly call macro prudential policy. I think we have to realize that monetary aggregates, contrary to those statements from Olivier Blanchard and Mervyn King, they do matter a lot. The size of bank balance sheets matter a lot. But interestingly, they don't matter primarily for the reason that the monetarists thought they mattered. It turns out to be not the case that an increase in the amount of money, which is a liability of the banking system, is a good forward indicator of inflation, but it is the case that an increase in credit, 
which is the asset side of the bank balance sheet, is a good forward indicator of future crisis, post-crisis debt overhang and deflation. And it is also the case that the mix of debt by category matters a lot, that there is a very different economic function from debt to finance consumption, debt to finance actual new investment, and debt to finance the purchase of existing assets. And what that implies, and I'll go very quickly over this, we cannot run monetary policy on the basis of one objective, a low and stable rate of inflation, and one tool, the interest rate. Nor can financial regulation focus just on ensuring the stability of the financial system itself, which, as I say, I think we've done quite a good job on. We have to have a point of view on the overall evolution of credit in the economy, of the overall level of leverage, and of the broad allocation of credit. And that has led me to some very radical propositions about what financial regulation should involve. I now believe that whereas I sat in those windowless rooms in Basel, arguing as a hawk against the doves at the other end of the table in favour of let's take the capital ratio up from 7.5% to 8%. I think it would be better at 7 at 8 He thought it was better at 7.5%. At if I was a benevolent dictator of a greenfield global economy, and though I'm not going to be a dictator, I would be benevolent if I was one, um, if I was a benevolent dictator of a greenfield global economy, I'd have banks which had leverage ratios of about 4 to 1 or 5 to 1, capital ratios of about 20 uh, to 25 percent. And I would demand that we set capital requirements for real estate lending higher than the private sector will ever set. Because I think we face a fundamental social externality, which is not, as it were, the banker's fault. Understand that seen from the private banker's point of view, trying to run their bank well, it will always make sense, and it truly will be less risky to lend money against real estate, but there is a side effect on that on the global economy which regulation has to capture. So I have ended up in a very radical space on the answer to the question, what do we do to stop building up too much credit in the first place? But that says nothing with how radical a space I've gone to when it comes to what the hell do we do about the mess that we're in. Because this is where my colleagues, my friends, central bankers really think I've gone sort of AWOL, uh, left the reservation, and proved myself an undependable person. Because I believe that the one thing that is clear in economics is that if our problem is an inadequacy of nominal demand, it is never the case, never the case, that governments and central banks together have run out of ammunition. That an inadequacy of aggregate nominal demand is one of the very few problems in economics to which there is always a certain answer. But it's quite a radical answer. Go back to the policy blocks against stimulating our economies with funded fiscal deficits. It's either because we're worried about debt sustainability or by what's called Ricardian equivalent effects, which basically means everybody knows you should be worried about debt sustainability, so you have a fiscal deficit, but they know they're going to have to pay it in future, so their extra savings offset the fiscal stimulus today. And as I say, ultra-loose monetary policy, adverse side effects, re-stimulate successive private credit growth. So we appear to be blocked. But there is always one thing you can do, and that is the overt monetary finance. The overt monetary finance of fiscal deficits. Central banks printing money and giving it to the government to spend. You can do this in a number of ways. You can money finance current fiscal deficits. You can do tax cuts or expenditure increase or what's called helicopter money, distributions of cash directly funded by central bank money creation. Or the central bank balance sheet, in that case, can be balanced by non-interest bearing perpetual asset due from the government. Or you can monetize bonds which were issued to fund past fiscal deficits. You can have a funded fiscal deficit, but then the central bank comes along afterwards and buys the bonds, and the bonds have effectively uh, disappeared. That's what would happen if you agreed that QE operations were never going to be reversed and would be permanent. Now, 
When you say this, people start saying, Adair, Weimar, Zimbabwe, hyperinflation, you've gone truly crazy. But if I have gone truly crazy, I've got some good company. <laughs> Henry Simons was one of the founding fathers of the uh, Chicago School of Free Market Economics. And he was a believer in very low rates of inflation and total free market economics. You don't get a more sound money than that. And he argued in 1936 that the price level should and could be controlled by expanding and contracting issues of actual money. Monetary rules should be implemented and in turn should largely determine fiscal policy. So far from saying that fiscal policy should be separate from monetary, he said you decide how big your fiscal deficit you want to run and then you money finance it. Meanwhile, Milton Friedman. Now, Milton Friedman is not normally known as a sort of crazy left-wing socialist inflation lover. But in two major articles in 1948 and 1960, he very clearly set out the case for monetary finance of fiscal deficits. He said government expenditures would be financed exclusively either by tax, there'd be no deficit at all, or the creation of money, and the chief function of the monetary authority should be the creation of money to meet government deficits. Well, poor old central bankers, they've been trying to say that that's the one thing they shouldn't do, and here's Milton Friedman telling them it's their chief function. And this is also, by the way, what Ben Bernanke correctly said to the Japanese that they should do in 2003. But doesn't this lead to hyperinflation? The answer is it depends entirely how much you do. Over on the right hand of this chart, there is somebody piling up uh, billions and trillions of mark notes in 1923. I think if we could look closely, every one of those blocks has sort of 500 notes, and every one of those notes is a 1 billion uh, Deutschmark note. Um, and that probably was put in a wheelbarrow and taken off to buy a loaf of bread. So, yes, if you go crazy with printing money, you will end up with hyperinflation. On the left, however, of this chart is uh, Korakio uh, Takahashi, finance minister of Japan who very effectively used monetary finance of fiscal deficits from 1931 to 36 to pull Japan out of a recession far more effectively than most of the economies in the world. He was a very responsible man. In 1936, he said, that's enough. We've got the economy going. I'm going to stop printing any more money. Unfortunately for him at that stage, the military assassinated him because they wanted him to keep printing money. But we can't count that against um, the basic point here, which is that if you responsibly use this tool, you will have moderate inflation. Indeed, it was all said, indeed, by Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations. He observed the fact that in the American uh, colonies of the, 19, of the 18th century, one in particular, Pennsylvania, used money finance, effectively stimulated the economy, and did not have excessive inflation. But that was dependent on the moderation with which the expedient was used. And the same expedient was deployed by several other American economies for want of this moderation produced much more disorder, i.e. hyperinflation. So the answer is that money finance of fiscal deficits, although it's been a taboo option, is something where the impact totally depends on how much you do. In technical terms, it can be calibrated. We can do a small amount or a large amount. The fundamental question, is whether in political terms that can do this case also. Because the real dangers of monetary finance are not technical. There are no technical reasons whatsoever why we cannot do monetary finance and why we cannot control its impact. But there are very major political risks. And the risks are that once we tell politicians it's possible, they'll want to do it all the time and in excessive amounts, not in appropriate amounts, in appropriate circumstances, which is why in a paper I just presented to the IMF Research Council in November, I called my paper The Case for Monetary Finance an essentially political issue. 
There is no doubt, and it's illustrated by Willem Boiter and Jordi Gali in complex mathematical papers, that this is a mechanism which will always stimulate nominal demand, and that in technical terms, provided you can trust the central bank and the political authority only to do a moderate amount, you will not have hyperinflation. But we're worried by the political risks. So the crucial thing here is, faced with an environment where we've got too much debt, and where all the other policy levers seem to be blocked, do we try to use this tool, or do we treat it as a medicine which could be useful in small quantities, but in large quantities is fatal, and which we therefore sort of put in a medicine cupboard and lock the door and throw away the key? Our policy in the advanced economies and in most emerging economies for the last 50 years has been based on making monetary finance the ultimate taboo. But my argument is we should not exclude it from the toolkit because we may end up having to need it. And you have to compare the risks of that with the risks of the alternative strategies. Debt, defaults and restructuring, or the risk of keeping the interest rate low pretty much forever in order to try to get rid of these debts. There are no easy choices here, and that is why my book is called Between Debt and the Devil. Now, the devil in the title is a famous figure from German literature. It is Mephistopheles in Wolfgang von Goethe's Faust, part two. And in Faust, part two, Mephistopheles the devil tempts the emperor, and he says, emperor, you don't need to be constrained in your public expenditures by how much you can tax your citizens, because you can print as much money as you want. And in autumn 2012, Jens Weidmann gave a speech in which he got pretty close to suggesting that Mario Draghi was beginning to grow a pair of horns, because he referred to Mephistopheles and Goethe's Faust Part Two as a warning against quantitative easing. And that belief that we should treat monetary finance as a total taboo uh, is central to our philosophy. But the key point I make at the end of the book is there are no perfect answers here. The way that we ran our economies for the last 50 years was to say we are, have a total taboo against monetary finance and we're totally relaxed about private credit creation. Because the crucial thing to realize is, if you go back to the basic theory about where nominal demand can come from in an economy, it must ultimately come either from governments creating new money and spending it, or from private banks creating new credit money and purchasing power. That's the only way you get an increase in nominal demand. And the core of my book is about recognizing that both of those carry great risks. We ended up with a philosophy that said we will have a total ban against any government printing and spending of money, but we are totally relaxed about however much and for whatever purposes private banks create credit, money, and purchasing power. We have to recognize that there are risks on both sides, that we are stuck between debt and the devil. Thank you very much.